want you to picture this for a moment. Remember when you were nine years old. At this age in Canada, I believe you were probably a third or fourth grader under the watch of your loving parents or guardians and enjoying some virtual protection from the government of Canada. Your days were filled with what kids do best, playing video games, skating, and running around without household responsibilities. In an ideal world, that is what we all want to say in every child. However, this was not the case for me. At the age of nine, I was in a refugee camp outside my home country, having fled from civil war. At that time, my priorities were different. My days were filled with worries and fears of when and where to get my next food, where to get security, and where to get medication. I was depressed. Oftentimes, I would sit down and feel angry at myself. I would feel angry at my parents for bringing me into this world and to witness its most ugly face. It was so painful for me to see my mother feeling helpless when we were angry and she could not feed us. It was so painful for me to see her breaking down when any of us fell sick and she could not afford a good medication. I saw the same pain in my siblings. I saw the pain in every child that I met in my neighborhood. And my mind could not stop thinking of whether there were possibilities for me to attend school and to change things in a foreseeable future. Even at that tender age, constant struggle had taught me to believe that there was no substitute for hard work and dedication. This is a true personal story, a reflection of my experiences as a child in a refugee camp. And as I stand here, narrating my own story without being reported on the media as we are used to, I can only say that I'm privileged to have your audience and to share it. I admit that this is only a single story out of millions of other refugee stories around the world. Currently, over six million people have been forcefully displaced in their homes. Others are in refugee camps, others are in displaced people camps, and others are seeking asylum. And out of those six million, 51% of that population are children being raised to survive and not being prepared for life. I was one of them. A few weeks ago, I was sharing it with few of my colleagues in the class, my story, and they were surprised. One of them asked me, Rhoda, how courageous are you to happily share this sad past without being intimidated or shy? But I told her that being a refugee for me was not a choice that I made. Neither did my parents decide to take me to a refugee camp but a predetermined circumstance that presented itself at my birth, and I had no choice but to accept and live it happily. That was a whole lecture. But I went home thinking a lot about it. I had a lot of what-ifs in my mind. What if there are other people out there who are living in frustrations of their past and are intimidated to share their stories? What if those millions of children in the refugee camps are living in denials of their circumstances, hence cannot move forward? Or what if someone asks me in an elevator and I have only five seconds to explain my journey to him before the door opens? What can I tell? That was the time that I got a statement that says, 
say yes to fate, but beat all the odds. A statement that summarized my journey from refugee camp to UBC campus. A journey of acceptance and struggle. I'm sharing this with you today because I want to encourage the over 51% of refugee children in the world to accept the fate and the fact that they have been deprived of their hopes and childhood happiness and homes, but to believe and have courage that they have not been deprived of their future. I'm sharing this because I want to acknowledge and appreciate the transformational act of individuals who work really hard to reach out to the refugee camp where I was and make me who I am today. If I remember this, the success of UNHCR, the support of World Vision, of UNICEF, of GRS, of WIP program, of WUSC, and even UBC students who are paying my tuition at the moment, I can only say that I'm privileged to have you. I'm sharing this with you because you deserve it. You deserve to know my story because you are the people who donate to charities that support refugees with food and clothing. I'm sharing this with you because you are the people who advocate, lobby, and sign petitions to welcome refugees into your countries and into your homes. I'm sharing this with you today because I believe that you are the same people who will do research on refugees' generations and come up with a groundbreaking finding that refugee camps is not actually a temporary solution to the permanent world problem, but a new millennium nation that needs to be equipped with better education facilities. I'm sharing this with you because I've lived it, and I know how it feels for your parents to lose everything and, leave, and raise you at the mercy of humanitarian aid. Well, I was born in a people's displaced camp at the border of Kenya and South Sudan. And I spent my early age moving from one camp to another until I reached the age of nine when I was moved to refugee camp Kakuma in Kenya. And for those who play chess, when the game is about to end and your king is in check, you are vulnerable. The decisions and choices that you make to move that king out are limited. And that is exactly how life is in, in Kakuma refugee camp and other camps in the world. In refugee, your life is in check. You are vulnerable to small decisions that you make, even working at night outside can cost your life. But there are a few opportunities there. And for me, I chose education. I took it seriously. I could go to the class without books or pens and sit down on the floor when the benches are filled just to listen. I would peep through the window in order to know what is going on in the class when the class is full. And being a girl at that circumstance was an added disadvantage. I was a little mother. I was helping my mom to raise an extended family of over 10 people without a penny, just on relief food. I would miss schools in order to go to the distribution centers to collect that food for the family. I would miss classes to go and collect firewood for the family. I would wake up at 4 o'clock to go and fetch water in order for me to get to school at 7. But more importantly, I had a vegetable garden that was planted with okra, peas, and kale, they call it sukumawiki in a local language. That garden, I used to sell the vegetable in order to get some money to buy kerosene that I use for lantern. 
there's no electricity in the refugee camp. Occasionally, my garden would not produce enough, or I may not get customers to buy my produce, and so I would not have light to study at night. But I would improvise a light by pouring a cooking oil into a tin bowl, put a burning charcoal in it to provide me with a dim light, just to do my assignments at night. I know you are wondering, that which room on this hut I was using when those small little rooms are being shared by five to four people. But there's a good news. In Kakuma refugee camps, temperatures at night are extremely high, and so people will choose to sleep outside. And I would take that opportunity to lock myself in that humid room, pour some water in a bucket, and place my feet in the water to cool myself as I study. I worked that hard because I knew hard work pays. I worked that hard because there were little opportunities and everyone was competing for them, and I had to. When we finally sat for our national examination at grade eight, I was fortunate enough to be among the best 20 students in the refugee camp. But I was not the first girl, and opportunities were only there for the first girl. That was the saddest moment of my life. I cried. I grieved for days because I knew the chance was gone. I had worked really hard for that position only to be taken in the last national examination. Even my mother lost hope and decided to get repatriated back to South Sudan when the peace was signed between Sudan and South Sudan. But I refused to go with her. I refused to drop out of school and get married. I refused to settle for something less than even a basic education that was being offered in the refugee camp. I remained in the camp with my aunt. And at that time, when I was about to join high school, a group of students from Murray State University came to a refugee camp with an initiative called Women Education Empowerment Project. They were looking for young South Sudanese girls to be sponsored to high school outside a refugee camp. And among the 10 girls chosen that year, I was lucky to be one of them. And to me, that was the dream come true. My feelings at that time would be shown in a second. When they get their education and see them working in southern Sudan as ministers. My feeling is very high in the sky when I cannot describe. When I dance or jump up, I don't know if my feeling will be seen. How do you feel? That was the time that I could not even describe my feelings because I really worked hard to get a scholarship. And as you can see, those are the classes behind me, the classes that I used to study in the refugee camp. I was so excited for that opportunity. I wanted to see myself a different perspective. And I was taken to high school of my choice the dream high school called Turkana Girls National School. When I joined, I was shocked to be welcomed by the girl who took the chance from me. And for the first time, to look into her eyes and smile. I hugged her, and I was relieved of my guilt for feeling sad because of her achievements. I realized I was so mean to not acknowledge her hard work to get that position. And that the time it revealed itself to me that this is a world of unlimited possibilities, that everyone has a chance and opportunity in life. And the only difference is that it comes at different 
times and in different forms. And from that time onward, we become best friends. We did not compete anymore. We worked really hard at that school and we were known in extracurricular activities as well as in academics. When we graduated from grade 12, we went back to refugee camp with something to show. And we landed into another prestigious scholarship that brought us to Canada. And as I speak, the girl is in Dalhousie University in Nova Scotia, as I am at UBC. If I reflect on the journey, I can see myself there in the refugee camp, better high school, outside refugee camp, and right now at UBC. And if you can see every step, there is an improvement, even the background shows. And so, if I looked at this, it reminds me of a quote by Michelle Obama when she said, if you work really hard and done well and walk through that doorway of opportunity, you do not slam it shut behind you, but you reach back and give that chance to other folks. And to me, it's powerful. This year, I inspired a group of UBC students, and we formed an initiative call a sponsor a child, just to give back what has been given to me by students from Murray State University in Kentucky. The Sponsor a Child initiative aims to sponsor refugee children in Kenya, but to create dialogue on campus on issues surrounding education and refugees, children. And this year, we held our conference the first of its kind that brought together UBC students, faculty members, and South Sudanese community who showcased their culture. As you've seen, in every problem, there is a takeaway. And I wonder sometimes if this world was so peaceful, such that the only problem that we should care about is solving for an X in a calculus equation. It would have really been a boring place to live in. We human create problems, we leave them, and we have the capacity to solve them. And for that case, my advice to each and everyone here is whatever problem that you encounter in life, either personal, relationship, family, or a disaster that affects everyone around you, Say yes to it, but have the courage to overcome it. And to everyone, I would love to tell you my new belief that we find love in giving love to people that we really care about and not in a hopeless place, as Rihanna puts it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.